William and Chene, who uh, Kevin uh, sent me the recordings. Of course, it was the middle of the night, my time, when um, they were presenting. But what a wonderful gift, a powerful gift to start my morning um, with those recordings. Uh, really something. And I want, I want to use those as my starting off point. Because for this question, what is the church? Well, I could give you my opinions, but who cares about my opinions? We're going to do this in the Word. But before we do, um, I want to just play a few moments of a song. I hope it's a familiar one to you. If not, it will be. Black body swinging. So for those not familiar, the great Billie Holiday um, singing Strange Fruit. Um, you know, one of the incredible protest songs of lynching uh, in the 20th century American South. Um, I first heard that song as a kid. My mom was a jazz fan and the album was on the shelf. and. I remember thinking, I wonder what this song is about. Strange Fruit, I had no idea. I must have been seven or eight at the time. Um, but now I know all too well. So uh, William and Chene put, um, put the challenge to us all here, didn't they? Uh, in terms of how the Christian tradition has um, extolled not, uh, I was going to say, not only the gospel of Jesus, but instead of the gospel of Jesus, uh, white European supremacy. Um, or in my side, you know, white supremacy without the European part. Um, and the fact that, um, uh, you know, a young Nigerian British woman has to make the argument that Jesus is not a white man in 2021 is just a shocking and tragic recognition of how far we are um, from where Jesus would have called us to be. Um, and yet it does need to happen. It does need to happen because we forget. Um, as I was saying to um, Kevin before we started today, you know, my own work, um, which, you know, I began doing this kind of work in the 80s, but I recognized when I began to look at the history of biblical scholarship that, you know, biblical scholarship started in Germany, and um, Germans were not that fond of making Jesus uh, the Asian Jew that he was. <laughs> not only was he a Jew, he was an Asian. Can you think of it that way? You know, I said to my you know, Asian American students that Jesus was not only not white, he was an Asian. And they're like, what? Well, what continent do you think Israel's in? Right? It's not Europe. Um, so, um, so that, that's disorienting for us, good, but it's unfortunate that it has to be in 2021. Um, so, what I want to do is what I do. <laughs> um, I'm not a theologian. I like to invite people into the word. So, I want to do that here. Um, by picking up something that I left off yesterday um, briefly and then trying to connect it back. And hopefully you'll see that this inspired by what Chine and William were leading us toward um, as a way of understanding what do we need to do to be church. So I've got two things on the screen, one of which we'll get to in a moment. I've got my biblical text here and just try to ignore that just for a moment. I'll come back to it uh, in a second. So I was noting, uh, sorry, yesterday that the Solomon, uh, uh, technical problems here, there we go. The Solomon story um, was in many ways a, a counter narrative to the Exodus story. And I didn't play that out, I showed some parallels. But I want to show uh, the scene where that really matters. Um, and that's actually not about Solomon, but his son Rehoboam. So this is in 1 Kings 12. So um, the, the writer has told us in chapter four of first kings that while solomon was king um everybody was under their vine and fig tree and all israel was happy and numerous and all was good but the moment solomon's done dead his son rehoboam um is uh, made king by all israel we see here and just as a parenthetical question if we were spending our time in this passage solomon is said to have had 700 wives and 300 concubines and he only has one child that ought to be a little suspicious but there's no rivals for the throne here. There's just Rehoboam. Okay, so be that as it may. So Rehoboam um, is going to be made king. And then there's this guy, Jeroboam. How many of you ever heard of Jeroboam, you good Christian people? Uh, I didn't think so, right? So a couple. So Jeroboam, it says, fled from, had fled from King Solomon. And then he returned when Rehoboam was king. So earlier, Jeroboam had fled away from Solomon to Egypt, of all places, and then returned when he heard that Rehoboam was king. So the Israelites send for him, and they all go to Rehoboam, and this is their evaluation of Solomon's reign. Your father made our yoke heavy. 
right? This is just a few chapters after the narrator said, and everybody was happy and wonderful under Solomon. Your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us, and we will serve you. And he said, go away for three days and come back. So they go away. So Rehoboam takes counsel with the elders who have the experience. And he says, how do you advise me? And they say, if you will be a servant to this people, speak good words to them and they will serve you forever. Um, but he disregarded that advice, um, typical, and went to the, to the people he'd grown up with, the young bucks that, you know, are trying to make their way in the imperial world. And he said to them, what do you advise that we answer the people who've said lighten the load? And they say this, this is what you should say. Your father made our yoke heavy and you must lighten it. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. And the original Hebrew doesn't say finger. Just want to note, this is the Bible, folks. It says, my little one is bigger than my father's loins. Do I have to explain that? Hopefully not. Um, but there it is in the Bible, friends. <laughs> right? um, this is the claim he's making for his power. Therefore, my father disciplined you with whips. I'll discipline you with scorpions. In other words, you haven't seen anything yet about royal imperial cruelty. And so they, they come, and, um, and when they hear the word, it says, all Israel, let me bring this up higher on the screen, when all Israel saw the king would not listen to them, the people answered, what share do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, O David. So Israel went away to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the Israelites who were in the towns of Judah. But when he sent the taskmaster over the forced labor, they stoned him to death, and he fled back and we end up with two kingdoms. Now, you may be wondering, why is he telling us this story? What does this have anything to do with what we're doing? Well, if you look at this chart now, you can see, and without a lot of detail, focus on it, that Jeroboam is a stand-in for Moses, or Moses is a stand-in for Jeroboam, is more accurate. So in the Exodus story, Moses represents Jeroboam, the person who goes to the harsh king and says, let my people go right? You know that, of course, in the Exodus story. You might not know about Jeroboam and Rehoboam, but I imagine you know about Moses and Pharaoh, right? Um, so hopefully you can get the resonance here that what Jeroboam is doing to Rehoboam is what Moses did to Pharaoh. And of course, in the Exodus story, Yahweh is on the side of Moses and not on the side of Pharaoh. So we as religion of creation people want to be on the side of Jeroboam, not on the side of Rehoboam. Um, so what we see is Israel had been subject to the, um, the monarchy in Jerusalem of the Judahites, but now has escaped. Okay, so now let's jump to the Gospel of John. So uh, for those not intimately familiar with the Gospel of John, chapter 3 and chapter 4, what Sue and I like to call a diptych, you know, a painting that has two pieces with a hinge there, where there's two separate images, but they interpret each other. Right. So chapter three is about Nicodemus. Chapter four is about Jesus meeting the woman at the well. And they're exact opposites. Um, if this was a class, I'd say, let's talk about the exact opposites. But my clock is ticking and it's not a class. So I'll just do it for you. So Nicodemus is a man. She's a woman. Nicodemus has a name. She does not. Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Um, Jesus goes to her. Nicodemus comes at night. Jesus meets the Samaritan woman in broad daylight. Nicodemus is an insider. The Samaritans are outsiders. Okay, so at every step of the way, these are opposite characters. Um, and so uh, this story in chapter three takes place right after Jesus overturned the tables and um, threatened the Judean establishment in Jerusalem, a story in the synoptics that doesn't take place till the beginning of Holy Week, right? But in John's gospel, it sets the stage right at the beginning. So Nicodemus has seen this, and we're told he's now, um, a, a ruler of the Judeans, excuse the Jews there, Judeans, he came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, we, whoever the we is, we know you're a teacher who's come from God. So that's his starting point. He is taking a risk. Jesus obviously disrupted the religious status quo, and the religious leaders have said, who do you think you are to be doing all this? And yet Nicodemus is choosing to secretly, but still, go to the protester, Right? Like the person who just disrupted your church service, and now the, the pastor is going to check out who is this person and claim that he knows he's a teacher sent from God. Pretty strong statement. And Jesus' response to him is, um, 
No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above or born again, born an oath. And Nicodemus says, what? <laughs> How can he be born after growing old? Can they enter their mother's womb and come out again? Now, obviously, that's a silly answer. It's supposed to be a joke. We were talking about humor yesterday. I hope you can laugh at that, that the religious leader is saying, you, you can't mean you crawl up your mother's birth canal and come out again, right? No, he can't mean that, can he? Um, so what does he mean? So he shifts it a little bit. No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Notice here it was, can see it, and here it is, enter it. You can't enter something unless you can see it first, right? When you see it, then you have the choice. I see the door. Do I want to walk through it or not? But first you have to see it, and then you can enter it. So you can't see it without starting all over again, and you can't enter it without being born of water and spirit, which is obviously a baptismal reference, not to Nicodemus, but to the audience, right? Nicodemus wouldn't know anything of being baptized into a way of Jesus, but the audience plainly would. Obviously, any reader now would go, oh, born of water and spirit, that means baptism. Um, and Nicodemus goes away going, huh? What? And Jesus says, you're a teacher of Israel and you don't get it? In other words, no wonder the people are so confused. If the teachers, even the good teachers, right, Kevin? Even the good teachers who come to Jesus and know he's a teacher sent from God don't get it. <laughs> no wonder the folks in the pews don't get it and still want the military Messiah or still think Jesus is a white man, you know, in British garb there. Right. So this story then goes to the narrator talking. And meanwhile, Jesus must go to Samaria. Um, and the had to here in chapter four is the Greek word dei, D-E-I in translated English, which means divine necessity. That it's part of his mission that he has to go through Samaria. Now, I won't bring up the map now for the sake of time, but if you have any sense of the geography there, Galilee's in the north, Samaria's in the middle, and Judah's in the south, uh, where Jerusalem is. Um, but the question is, who are the Samaritans? When we just last looked, there was Israel in the north, and then there was Judah in the south. And now there's Galilee, Samaria, and Judea. So who are these people? Well, we need to go back and see. So if we go back to 2 Kings uh, uh, 24 here, we'll see that after the Assyrians conquered the kingdom that Jeroboam had led there, the Israelite kingdom in the north, um, he brought people from five places, including Babylon. Um, the Babylonian Empire succeeded the Assyrians, so this is before that. This was in the 720s or so, PCE. So they, they brought people from these places and put them in the cities of Samaria in place of the people of Israel. In other words, the Samaritans are the successors of the Israelites, but now with mixed blood because they intermarry um, with these people. Um, and the Assyrian purpose of intermarriage is imperial. It's to get them to assimilate, to lose their sense of original identity. In other words, um, wherever you're from, you're Americans now, or your equivalent of that, right? You're no longer Mexicans, you're no longer Nigerians, because you have this better identity as Americans, and that's what makes you part of us, all right? So the Assyrians are saying, you're no longer going to be Israelites, you're part of the Assyrian Empire, and so intermarriage will dilute that sense of your pride in who you were, which leads to this text, um, after the exile, um, when the uh, priest scribe Ezra is sponsored by the Persian king to go back and rebuild Jerusalem for Persian military purposes, but I won't go there now, um, the people come to, to him. He's the me speaking here, Ezra. The people of Israel, notice people of Israel, the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands with their abominations. Notice these are the peoples that we saw in Deuteronomy 7 yesterday. And the Egyptians, they have taken some of their daughters as wives and their sons. The holy seed has mixed itself with the peoples of the land. And Ezra tears his garment and thinks this is the worst thing ever. And he's ashamed and embarrassed in his prayer that the people have lost their sense of ethnic purity. 
Um, and so he vows that what they will do is not only in the future not give daughters, you know, in, in intermarriage, but as I think someone mentioned in passing yesterday, demands that if you're going to be part of this restored community, um, you must get rid of your foreign wives and children. This is going to be pure seed in this new community, no ethnic mixing. Okay, that's the situation Jesus comes into in John 4. Okay. The Samaritans have for 700 years been treated as the local black people, as the local Palestinians, as the local whoever, the people who were here first and have been here all along, but are now being treated as impure, unclean, inferior, not worthy. Okay, So hopefully that draws some connection there with Chinay and William. So what Jesus does here is undo all this. Um, he talks to her, and um, we won't deal with the Jacob's well piece for the moment because I have limited time. But um, he says to her, give me a drink. And the disciples typically are not there. <laughs> and she says, how is it you, a Judean, so important here, Judean, somebody from Judea, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Because in other words, this is a Samaritan's only fountain. And you people say that there's a Judeans only fountain over there. It's like translate this to the American South, you know, where William was talking or where Billy Holiday was talking, you know. So the white man walks into a little town in Mississippi and asks the local black woman, um, can I have a drink? And she says, you folks made these rules. You know, it's not OK for you to drink at our fountain. Like, what do you think you're doing here? The segregation business is your idea, after all. Um, so that's what's going on here. And he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying you give me a drink, you would have asked him. And he would have given you living water, which is a metaphor for water that flows. Before it's a spiritual metaphor in their culture, it's a, a metaphor for water that flows, river water, as opposed to the well water. And she says, you don't have a bucket and the well is deep. She's kind of feisty here, right? Um, are you greater than our father, Jacob? And then he goes on, for the sake of time, I got to wrap this up. And then he says, to what untrained or uncareful listening ear sounds like a change of subject, go call your husband. What? And she says, I have no husband. He says, you're right. You're saying I have no husband. You have five husbands. And one you have now is not your husband. And people who don't know the context read this as like Jesus is some kind of magician. You know, hold, pick a card from the deck and I'll tell you what kind of card it is. Three of clubs. You know, I tell, don't tell me. I know how many husbands you've had people this is not what's going on here i've given you some clues anybody catch the the connection here with you've had five men literally what it means um in relation to the background i shared a few minutes ago anybody catch it i didn't expect you might but maybe you did how many nations did the assyrians bring in to intermix with the Israelites in that passage in 2 Kings 17? Anybody note? Want to guess? Anybody want to guess five? <laughs> That's the answer. In other words, this is not a historical event. This is a narrated parable about the message that Jesus is bringing about who God really is. Um, that God knows people intimately, um, and that God's desire is to overcome all the ways we've created barriers between us that separate us into superior and inferior, and, you know, insiders, outsiders, etc. Whether it's the heresy of Tertullian or the racism of Christian history that Shine so painfully and passionately laid out. Um, so the one you have now is not your husband, is Rome because they've not intermarried with the Romans. And so she gets it, and he gets it. And if we were to stay with this, you know, she says, so where's the right place to worship? Isn't that the real question? Mount Zion in Jerusalem, which is what this whole Samaritan hostility is about, like we can't have their unclean mongrel feet in our holy city. Um, and he says, neither, neither. But the hour is coming when worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, which of course is anywhere, not about a place. It's about an, a way of being. And so when she gets that, 
she witnesses to her people. She leaves her water jar behind, forget the disciples for now, um, who don't get it as usual, um, and uh, witnesses to them, and they come. And they say to the woman, it is no longer because of what uh, you said we believe. We have heard for ourselves, and we know this is truly the Savior of the world. That's the only time in the Bible that phrase is used, Savior of the world. But to the audience of John's gospel in the late first century Roman Empire, it would have been obvious what that meant. It's a reference to the emperor uh, Domitian, whose coins declared him savior of the world. On the other side of the same coin, speaking of John's gospel in chapter 20, it called him Lord and God. So you can think of Thomas at the end proclaiming Jesus, my Lord and my God, not the emperor. I'd note, just to complete the thread there, I'd note that when the Judean leaders and Pilate are finished with their thing in John 19, Pilate gets them to say, in response to his question, should I crucify your king? We have no king but the emperor. Okay. So throughout John's gospel, um, Jesus is desperately trying to get his disciples to understand that the message they're getting from their religious leadership is not the truth of God. <laughs> a task he sees as taking up from Ezekiel before him. So in John 10, when he says, I'm the good shepherd, um, other shepherds are, don't care about the sheep because they're in it for the money, they get paid. He's evoking Ezekiel 34, uh, a text where Ezekiel castigates the leaders before the Jerusalem exile for causing the exile that they, instead of feeding the sheep, they were getting fat off the sheep, Ezekiel um, sadly, bitterly notes. Um, so, um, so back to what does it mean for us to be church? <laughs> After this little race through some scripture passages. Um, if we were doing the work that Jesus gave us to do, Chene wouldn't have had to do the work she did. Right? We would not be dealing in the 21st century with what race was Jesus and what ethnicity are Christians supposed to be? And what does this have to do with European history and colonialism? We wouldn't be having any of those conversations um, because we would have it in our marrow, <clears throat> you know, in the very cells of our being here, that if we were got baptized, if we're reborn in water and spirit, then we're a hundred percent committed to the way of Jesus, which is everybody is in the image and likeness of God. There's no basis in calling upon God to justify why we think anything about us is superior to anybody else. But we haven't done our homework, right? So we don't know these stories. Uh, you know, I am not challenging any of you. Some of you are probably older than me, and you've been probably members of the church a lot longer than me. Um, is this how you were taught John 4, what John 4 was about? Why not, one might ask. Yeah. You know, um, and that business about the five kings and the five people, that's not even my idea. I read that somewhere, incorporated in my book 27 years ago now. So it's not like I just discovered that yesterday or you didn't, you know, it's been around for decades, that insight into these stories. Um, so my first challenge and invitation is we need to know our stories. We need to take the time to do this kind of work. Um, and not as a task, but as an opportunity. Um, that anybody who's been part of our Thursday group, and, and Bud, you're still here, you've been a part of it a couple of times, or Julius, one of my Seattle U students who's somewhere on, this, on these screens. No, um, if you're doing it right, I hope it's fun. It's exciting. It's not dreary and dull, because not only is it the act of discovery, but because as I hope we're going to close today, in Luke 24, think of the disciples on the road to Emmaus story, right? Um, we had been hoping, they say to the risen Jesus who's standing there right next to them, they don't recognize. And what's Jesus' response to them? You fools! <laughs> you fools! How slow you are to understand the scriptures! <laughs> And so it's beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted the scriptures to them. And what's their response? Their hearts were on fire. 
And in the middle of the night, they do the really stupid thing of running back seven miles to Jerusalem, which is like really stupid, right? It's dark. There are robbers out there. There are wild animals. They don't have flashlights. You know? It could wait till morning, except it couldn't. It couldn't wait one minute because they were on fire. Um, and that's what I hope, that's certainly what Jesus understood, that when we enter into this word, it does to us. It sets us on fire. It fills us with that spirit that we call holy and empowers us to not be afraid, to let down the sense we have to be right, um, you know, to welcome everybody, and to have the kind of worship we see in the book of Revelation which I do want to share here because a little closing to this. I don't even know what my time, how my time is, but sometimes it's Kronos and not Kairos, right? Um, so just to go here. So this is um, one of the scenes of heavenly worship in Revelation in chapter 7, and John's narrating what he hears and what he sees, and what he hears is what he's been taught, and what he sees is what his experience is. So he heard the number of those who were sealed, which to say sealed, having the seal of the living God, and what he hears is 144,000 from every tribe of the people of Israel, and then the 12 tribes are listed, 12,000 of each. Um, um, but when he looked, what does he see? A great multitude that no one could count from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches, proclaiming in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb, and they all worship. In other words, what he um, had heard was that in the end, in the messianic era, in the time of Zoe Aeonion, in Greek, eternal life, Israelites from all tribes would be saved. But when he looked, he saw people from every tribe, from every nation, not giving up who they were to be gathered there, but as they are, as Nigerians, as Cambodians, as British, as Cherokee, and the list goes on. In other words, not having to sacrifice the identity you gain from the cultural relationship with a place and over time, but to incorporate that into this higher identity as children of God. So I think I'll stop there. Maybe in the Q&A, um, some other practical things can come out because I know we want some practical things and not just this visionary stuff. Um, and I don't know how, the, how we're 1204 or probably okay. All right, I'll stop there and pass it back.